Say yay! yay! Like you mean it! Yay! And you're very excited and you're clapping! Woo! Woo! Yeah! Throw underwear! No, don't do that. Now then, I am in fact the Bluebeard. You are all in fact very impressed and that's why you're sitting there smiling at me. I'm Foxen and I got a song that that Jane the Fool taught me um, um, last summer, I think. And it goes like this. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. <clears throat> Tomorrow the foxin comes to town. Keep, 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 keep. Tomorrow the foxin comes to town. I'll keep you all well there. I must require your neighbours all to follow the fox out of the hall and cry as loud as you can call. Woof, 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 woof. And cry as loud as you can call to keep you all well there. He'll steal the honeys from the pen, keep, 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 he'll steal the honeys from the pen, I'll keep you all well there. He'll steal the duckies from the brook, keep, 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 he'll steal the duckies from the brook, I'll keep you all well there. He'll steal the lammies from the pen, keep, 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 he'll steal the lammies from the pen, I'll keep you all well there. I must require your neighbours all to hurry the fox out of the hall and cry as loud as you can call. Woof, 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 woof! And cry as loud as you can call to keep you all well back. And that was it. Very nice. Did you done. like it? Well done. Father. Oh, thank well you, done. madam. Thank you. I do try. here with Jeffrey Jeffrey and Larry Larry uh, would you gentlemen please care to kind of tell us about your exhibit and your display we might have to cut here because this isn't our exhibit oh oops over here. oh you need to come be on camera <laughs> we're ready hi this is Paula Martins and I am with Tim Wakeling from the 5th Armor Division. Well, Tim, you have quite an impressive exhibit here, so would you care to tell the audience about some of the items here that you have on, on display? Absolutely. Uh, this year we have Bad Check, our, our uh, M3 half-track again. Uh, Bad Check was a radio truck, so she more or less spent the majority of her time out in the front or out in the back. Depends. Well, in this particular instance, we're you know, portraying us in the back. Just radioing commands in, telling you know forward operations bases where to send tanks, where to send trucks, where to send fuel. We're basically a communications point. So because we're a communications point, we've uh, liberated some tablecloths and some curtains, yes, and whatever else, to uh, attempt to. I was going to in with the environment of the great polar vortex going on. Okay, I was just wondering, it was this specific, or are you just wanting to feel pretty today, or? We, <laughs> this this all kind of came to a head. Uh, Military History Fest, you know, we've uh, we've been to actually all ten of them, mm -hmm. but um, everybody likes you know posting up those very odd, unique photos. Well, the odd, unique photo that I found this year was a guy from the 102nd Infantry Division that was attached to 5 AD with a doily on his helmet as a camouflage cover. So the more we started digging into doilies and lace curtains and things like that, we found out that not only was it you know, prevalent, but it was what they did exclusively. And it was specifically armored infantry latched onto it because, well, armored infantry, we have half-tracks. We can carry anything. So, of course, as soon as we got into, you know, into France, we said, oh, look, tablecloths, uh, curtains, what? Because we weren't issued winter camouflage. They would cover the vehicles with bed sheets, tablecloths. They would throw the laced oilies over top of themselves, use their helmet, you know, whatever they could find that they just got out of the out of you know France and Belgium, and use it to cover things with. You know, and which makes sense because it's it's resourceful. And hey, you had to use what you could find. It's it's resourceful, but also when you look at something like a laced oily, as you notice, you can see a little bit of green through it. So if you're in a wooded forest or something like that, you're not really trying to make yourself perfectly white because you stand out more if you're perfectly white wearing like a, a true ghost costume just throwing a sheet right over you because now you stand out against the trees. But if you wear something that has a breakable pattern, well, if you look at like a ghillie suit um, in modern military, this was actually the first winter ghillie suit was a bunch of lace curtains tossed over top of your helmet and over top of everything. Makes, makes perfect sense. And I can see why they used it. And you look lovely, too. 
<laughs> All right, we are standing here in the kitchen exhibit. So tell us some more about uh, this. Well, this is my kitchen. This is your kitchen. My right. kitchen. Very lovely kitchen indeed. Uh, Armored Infantry was very famous as well for being one of the, the first units to get what was called the 10 and 1. Most of the time your infantry regiments, etc. were issued like this, your K rations, or your C rations, or etc. etc. which was the post-day equivalent of an MRE. However, a neat little experiment was done with uh, the Armored Divisions called the 10 and 1. And it was nothing more than canned fruits, vegetables, and meats thrown into a box, and one box fed ten men for one day. But they didn't really think too much about training the infantrymen that were in the half-tracks how to cook. So it was very important to have somebody in your actual half-track, your device, that knew how to cook. Because if you had somebody who knew how to cook, you basically have the raid of grandma's cupboard because the stuff that you're getting is the exact same stuff that was being purchased in the United States at that time. Canned, you know, uh, green beans, uh, spam, you name it, whatever else. Any of your canned goods. It was the same stuff that you were buying in commercial supermarkets. They would just put it in a box and put U.S. Army on it and ship it. A lot of times we would, they would open the boxes and they had, you know, the green giant brand names or whatever. They were actually the brand name products shoved in there. So this was the solution for that. And that is the X141 camp stove. Here, well, why don't we both, uh, here, let me move over here, excuse me, and then you can show what each I get. That is an original X141 camp stove. And it is the only one that I've ever seen in my life and the only one that anyone else has ever seen. It was a prototype camp stove built to the dimensions of the under seat rack of a half track specifically designed to fit under a half-track and, most importantly, use the tire pump from a half-track to be able to put pressure in the bottle and use the same gasoline that the half-track used. So you had everything that you needed except a camp stove. So all they did is they gave you a box with two burners on it and said, here you go guys, now you can cook your tender ones. And that's pretty much what we've got here. We've got a, a, a more, I guess you could say, civilian grade because a lot of the camp stoves that were issued during World War II were civilian grade because they were just 1930s and 40s vintage camping gear. Whatever any manufacturer already had in production was what was built. And they would just send it out to the field and there it was. But this now, is... Now when you do go out into the field for events and living histories, do you still use these to cook or are these just display only? I use these to cook on Tuesday. <laughs> I, I use it at home. I mean, it, it's it's absolutely a, a riot going out and, and cooking in your backyard in sub-zero temperatures on on a camp stove that's 75 years old that still works. Right, yeah. And I now I, explain you have the the towels uh, here. You were uh, our, our liberated Nazi towels. Yeah. Yes, we 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 liberate lots of Nazi things. We liberate Nazi machine guns. We liberate Nazi ammunition. We liberate Nazi towels. Those are just the most absorbent towels that I've ever seen. So, of course, we had to just steal them. Yeah, uh, perfectly understandable. Can you tell us a bit about your liberated Nazi machine guns here? Absolutely. These are very impressive. <laughs> well, the, the primary armament of an armored division was the 1919 caliber Browning. And most half-tracks carried three 30 caliber Brownings and one 50 caliber Browning. But anytime you ran across anything that was a machine gun, if you were on a half track, you had a place to put it. You would just tie it to the half track. So that has an MG34, which of course we would shoot it till it was out of ammo. When it's out of ammo, we'd either break it in half or you know disassemble it, throw it away so that it couldn't be reutilized, or we would just keep it as a trophy and drive around until we found some more ammo for it. Because the less wear and tear and beating that we can put on our own equipment, the better. And a lot of people don't understand that that the U.S. infantry and the U.S. You know, armored infantry specifically was as, su as successful as they were, not because of how they utilized their equipment, but how they didn't utilize their equipment in a lot of occasions. And taking the wear and tear off of your 30 caliber Browning so that you don't have to clean it, you don't have to oil it, you don't have to take it apart, you can just throw, throw the cover over it, use the MG42 until it, or MG34 until it's empty, throw it over the side of the half track with a, with a spike or a squib round, and then go back to your 30. It happened very, very often. I mean, I, I, thousands of, of occasions where captured machine guns or captured anti-tank guns, whatever, were utilized until they were out of ammo, and then they would spike them and throw them. Ladies, I would like to talk to you about your outfits. Let me get onto the 
big people level here. We have a little one and a big one. So could you tell us your name and your unit you're with? Um, my name is Betsy Irvin. I'm not really with the unit. I'm kind of a independent. <laughs> you have quite an impressive look. So can you tell us about your, your outfit? Um, my It's a early 1800s ensemble with a very high umpire waist um, square neckline. I'm wearing a chemisette to kind of fill in the open neckline on top and I'm also wearing a turban that was very fashionable at the time. As it, it is so quite lovely and another question I wanted to ask is you have a young one here with you. Uh, there are lots of people involved in living history that do have children but are often afraid to come out because they don't want to bring their kids or they think well I have a child I can't do this this hobby anymore so you obviously have brought this young lady out. Can you tell us about reenacting with a child? You bet. Um, actually, this is my granddaughter, <laughs> and she's been coming out since she was about, I don't know, four or five weeks old. <laughs> so, weeks um, old, okay. Yes, but her, her, her father started reenacting with us when we did Civil War, well, and we did 1830s too, when he was about seven or eight years old. So, yeah, so her father grew up in doing it, and now she's growing up doing it as well. Fantastic! It's good to see the young, the young people out because they, they seem to be not represented very much, yeah. and and people tend to forget children, and they yeah. were very much a part of history. Uh, what happened in history happened to children too, and people do not consider that at all. That they tend to bear the brunt of a lot of historical uh, happenings from wars, famines, plagues, everything. Yes. And unlike adults, it's a bit more difficult for them to defend themselves. That's uh, true. That's true. <laughs> Well, I, when I've done study about uh, the resistance movements during World War II, some of the pictures I've come across from Eastern European partisans have been children. Uh, one photo, it, these children look around the age of 8 to 12 years old, taking up arms to fight the Germans. And that's, we don't think of that. No, we don't. No, you know. We don't. One thing that's kind of fun with our time period is, is that at this time period, instead of children just saw, seen as miniature adults, this is what started the... Um, a cult, the cult of a child when we started looking at children as their own little individual things clothing seems starts to be designed just for children instead of miniature versions of adults so um, so that that's kind of an exciting thing that was happening at the beginning of the um, 1800s well we're here this weekend for the reenactor fest here in St. Charles and uh, particular impression we're doing here this weekend is this entire area here is the 350 for German infantry and the group here on the outside is doing a medical World War II impression but we're doing World War I uh, these are Ulans. Uh, it's a different type uniform that they would have used during this time period the troopers carried a lance they also carried a carbine um, there wasn't much cavalry actions in the worst World War uh, they came up with the machine gun and that pretty much put them into a situation where they went into trench warfare so most of the horse action that you saw during the first world war was usually supply horses or artillery sections moving supply horses or moving the guns up to the front he doesn't want to talk what can I say you know good helps hard to find so uh, the horse gear you see here today is pretty much all original uh, the saddles and everything, uh, they, there's a company in Germany still making the 1934 saddle, 1925, uh, but they aren't very much, and most of the ones that we get now, <coughs> we buy as, as uh, uh, off eBay or from private individuals. So, yeah. Most everything you see here is pretty standard for the cavalryman, uh, blanket roll, uh, great coat, saddle bags, mess kit. Um, the helmet hanger on the side allows you to take your helmet off during hot weather. We've seen a lot of original pictures of the guys with their tunics open and their sleeves rolled up, their helmets uh, hanging on the side of the horse. This is your World War I helmet. Um, the two little um, studs on the side here was for a visor when they were doing trench warfare so that the guys could look up out of the trench and not get shot in the head by a sniper on the opposite side. So, um, The wagon behind us here is a World War I ambulance. Um, usually it could carry four to six men uh, off the battlefield or move men or supplies from one location to another. It was usually pulled by two horses uh, with a driver sitting on the seat driven as a regular team of horses. The Lances were pre-World War I, uh, 1890 
to 1915, of course, when the First World War started, uh, the lance became somewhat obsolete. It was still used in ceremonial parades and stuff, but was pretty much uh, dropped out in lieu of the men carrying a carbine. Uh, which was a shorter version of the German rifle for the men to carry on their back when they were in the field. So the horse, the horse was transportation. Uh, the cavalry charges that you saw in the Napoleonic Wars and up through the American Civil War, the machine gun pretty much did away with any kind of cavalry charges. Uh, if you possibly saw the movie The War Horse, the uh, British cavalry charging the German camp with the water-cooled machine guns was a good example of what happened to cavalry. As a result, horses were used to maneuver in the background. Men would dismount, horse holders would take the horses to the rear. Uh, basically, the cavalry now uses helicopters. Back then, we used horses. At the same time, you wanted to save the horses, so you would move them out of the area, behind walls, down in ditches, uh, and then the men would advance on foot. The title of this panel is Get Real, and mostly that means that uh, getting to the real human nature that spans all of history. So it's a way to really connect with the past to our modern life. Um, and it's a way to connect the public to a little caveat on this workshop. The four of us mostly do first person reenactment, so we are in character portraying the time period. This stuff totally works in third person as well, but most of the stories we're going to tell are first person. And you know what? I find it even works when doing research, when, when uh, reading these dates and facts and everything to get to the personalities. What, so what would that person have been thought of by all of their colleagues? How do they feel about themselves? and all that stuff. So we'll be talking both about personality types, but also how people interact with other people and, and sometimes in conflict as well as...